Welcome to the Elisa Childers podcast, where we equip Christians to identify the core beliefs of historic Christianity, discern its counterfeits, and proclaim the gospel with clarity, kindness, and truth. And I have just had a wonderful conversation with Dr. Andrew Ike Shepherdson and Dr. Doug Groyteis, who have together just written a wonderful intro to apologetics called The Knowledge of God in the World and the Word. It's just a really basic introduction to apologetics, and this is the big apologetics episode for you today. There are some serious highlights for me uh, from this conversation that I've just had. Number one, they defined apologetics. They identified some of the misconceptions that people have about apologetics and how we can do better. We talked about how some Christians feel like doing apologetics hinders the work of the Holy Spirit or the claim that you can't argue people into the kingdom. We talked through some of that. Then we talked about the difference between presuppositional apologetics and classical apologetics. If you're new to the apologetics conversation, This will really help you understand the different methodologies in the world of apologetics. And then we just talked through three of the major arguments for the existence of God, the cosmological argument, the argument from design, and the moral argument, and then threw in some objections there, too, that you might face when you're having conversations with your friends. What a great conversation. I think you're going to get so much out of this, and I can't wait to share it with you. So here is Dr. Andrew Ike Shepherdson and Dr. Doug Groyteis. All right. Well, Doug, you have become quite the regular on the show. It's always fun to have you on. And Ike, this is your first time. Welcome. Ike, for anybody who's unfamiliar with you and your work, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So I'm uh, a graduate of Doug's program in apologetics at Denver Seminary, and I went on to study um, uh, philosophy of religion at the University of Toronto. Uh, Today, I lead the programs in applied apologetics at Colorado Christian University, and I'm an elder at my church, Living Way Fellowship in Highlands Ranch, Colorado. Great to meet you. Awesome. All right. Great. Well, it's great to have both of you on. I I would love to start by asking you, you know, I mentioned your book in the intro, which is just wonderful, by the way. I've really enjoyed reading through it. I'm not all the way through it yet, but a good bit. And every bit of it is just so clear. It's easy to understand. And it's really giving all that basic information about apologetics, which I think is a topic that's greatly misunderstood among Christians. Uh, So I'll characterize it this way. Among progressives, it seems to be they think apologetics is sort of like just circling the wagons, repeating talking points, trying to keep people believing these very narrow doctrines. And I think that's a great misunderstanding. But then there's also misunderstanding from evangelicals where they might think that it's just for stuffy professors or it's just a way to kind of beat people up with your arguments, or maybe it's a way of circumventing the work of the Holy Spirit. There's so many different ideas out there about what apologetics is. So I tell us why you wrote this book and maybe just give us a baseline definition of apologetics, and then we'll talk through some of those objections. This book was written for precisely to counter the kinds of objections that you describe here. This is for the lay Christian who has no formal training in philosophy or in theological studies, but cares deeply about speaking to their friends, coworkers, family members about the truth of their hope in Jesus Christ. Apologetics is just that. It's defending and commending the Christian faith as true and rational and pertinent to every aspect of life. Every Christian should have have something to gain from learning about how to communicate well about why they believe Christianity is true. Now, for a lot of us, this starts with our personal testimonies of how we've come to know the Lord, but it extends so much deeper and richer than that, that Christianity itself is a knowledge tradition that has good reasons uh, to believe it. So we've, we found that what was missing in the world is just a simple introduction Mm -hmm. to why somebody might believe that Christianity is true and rational. That's what this book attempts to do. That's really good. And I know we've all had conversations maybe with a loved one or a friend who, you know, maybe we're just sitting at coffee and they say, well, I don't believe in Christianity because the Bible's been corrupted, or I just, you know, people don't come out of tombs and and become raised from the dead. And so they have these intellectual objections that are kind of clouding their view of the cross or clouding their view of their ability to even be able to hear the gospel. Now, of course, anybody can preach the gospel anytime, and the Holy Spirit can move somebody to accept that. Absolutely. But I do want to address kind of some of these misconceptions 
about apologetics. Doug, you know, you've been in this for so long. You are really one of the original kind of apologetics. You've literally written the textbook that many seminaries use. What do you think is the biggest obstacle that Christians are facing when it comes to apologetics? Like when you say the word apologetics, what's the biggest obstacle for people? Well, some people really don't know what the word means, so they hear it and think, I have to tell people I'm sorry I'm a Christian, or I hold all these irrational beliefs, but I can't help it because the Holy Spirit makes me. So you have to go back to the meaning of the word, and it means to give a defense, an apology. So we're trying to give a rational defense to why we believe in the gospel in Christ and the whole Bible. And I think one thing that stops people is that people have a wrong understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So we try to really emphasize what you might call the intellectual role of the Holy Spirit in our apologetics. It's not that you use the flesh to give rational arguments and then hope the Holy Spirit will somehow magically intervene because the arguments really don't do much good. We believe the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, and we believe Christ is the Logos, the logic of all of reality. So when we are trying to speak the truth in love with reason to an unbeliever, we want the Holy Spirit, we believe the Holy Spirit is involved in that task. So it's not only when we start talking about the atoning work of Christ and the need for saving faith that the Holy Spirit kicks in, so to speak. Yeah. So we spend a lot of the time in our book on basic arguments for the existence of a, a rational, moral, personal God. So that's part of our strategy. It's called classical apologetics. You argue first for God on the basis of what's called natural theology, design arguments, cosmological arguments, moral arguments. And once you have that basis or that foundation, you say, well, has God spoken to us in history? Has he even come to us? in the person of Christ. So especially if you're dealing with atheists, and we're seeing an increase in the number and militancy of atheists in the United States, you can't just say, okay, here's the gospel. There's a God. You've got to get right with God. And they say, wait a minute. I don't just speaking the gospel again, louder volume, hmm. or with more passion is not necessarily going to help. So you may need to move back a step. And say, well, Jesus said, uh, if you believe in God, believe also in me. But let's now talk about the reasons we have for believing in God. And some people think that these arguments are too complicated, abstract, abstruse. They can be very complicated. And in fact, I think we can defend them at a very high intellectual level when needed. But we can also state the basic arguments clearly and directly in a way that can be compelling to the atheist or the Well, yeah, because one thing that uh, often when I'm trying, and other apologists I know are trying to maybe sell their church on doing apologetics or having an apologetics class is people will say, well, you can't argue people into the kingdom. So, Ike, what would you say maybe to a pastor who might say, well, you can't argue people into the kingdom, so we don't need to do apologetics in church? Now, I think this is a misconception on what apologetics is attempting to do. And you even said it yourself, Alicia, at, at, at the beginning of the podcast, you, you described this as, as somebody who maybe has some roadblocks or some objections. And apologetics really just starts to clear the ground intellectually for the truth of the Christian faith. It helps, it helps the unbeliever to consider the claims that Christianity uh, uh, is true and rational. So, of course, you can't argue anyone into the kingdom. Apologetics isn't trying to do that. But apologetics takes very seriously that people have real objections. I think of them as roadblocks between them and Jesus. And I always tell my students, imagine uh, a loved one who doesn't know the Lord yet and the Lord himself. And between them is some intellectual roadblocks. The most loving thing that you can do is to take those roadblocks seriously and start to address them one by one carefully. And, uh, you know, the approach that we take is that for a lot of people, it's not even plausible that God exists. And so we try to say, well, let's just establish that God exists. Or one of the issues you mentioned as well, Elisa, which is uh, the Bible is, you know, is made up or it's a, it's a set of myths. Well, let's address that objection. And you take those things piece by piece. And that's the most loving thing that we can do for our unbelieving friends to take seriously 
the reasons that they may have rejected Christian faith. Yeah, that's a good point. And even I would say in our postmodern culture, sometimes we even have to take a step back from that and establish what truth even is or if it exists and can be known when it comes to things like religion and morality. So, Doug, there are two, you know, there's there's different schools of thought as we approach the topic of apologetics. Of course, you both are uh, giving an introduction to classical apologetics, which is primarily what I would say I am more in the vein of classical apologetics. But there's uh, many of our viewers and listeners may not have heard of the other school that's called presuppositional apologetics. And so there's always kind of this debate between presuppositional apologetics and classical or even evidential apologetics. Doug, can you help us understand what the difference is between those two and why you are primarily promoting the classical view of apologetics? Yes, you can get really complicated in terms of debating apologetic method. And I think we need to get clear on it and then actually do apologetics. And there's a concern I have sometimes for Christians who just talk to other Christians about what the best method is, and they don't get out there and take it to the streets to unbelievers. Uh, I find a lot of strengths in presuppositional apologetics with people like Cornelius Van Til, Greg Bonson, Gordon Clark, Carl Henry, But I think it's a little bit limited because they say you have to presuppose the Christian worldview and then go after the non-Christian worldview as illogical. And that's a good way to go. But Ike and I believe that there is strong positive evidence from nature and from history to support the presuppositions of a biblical worldview. So we say the unbeliever needs evidence, needs arguments. Yes, he or she is a sinner. And naturally, we push back against the claims of God on our lives. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth, we can give evidence, for example, from physics and cosmology, that it's a far better explanation for the world to say it began a finite time ago, created by a spaceless, timeless, vastly powerful being, than the idea that has always existed. Or alternatively, that it just popped into being out of nothing for no reason, which Dallas Willard called Big Bang mysticism. I mean, talk about irrational faith. There are atheists who say, instead of believing in one God who created the universe, we'll believe that everything came into being out of absolutely nothing for no reason. And you call that rational? No, that's a terrible explanation. In fact, it's not even an explanation. You have to deny essential human rationality to posit that kind of state of affairs. So the presuppositionalists will sometimes say, no, we don't really want to give the unbeliever uh, arguments based on reasoning and evidence. We want to presuppose the whole worldview of Christianity and then attack their worldview. I say we can do both. We can do what's called negative apologetics. Atheism, pantheism, polytheism doesn't explain the world or ourselves or give us meaning. And then we've got plenty of evidence from science and history and human testimony that the Christian message is true. And so if someone's an atheist, Uh, We want them to know what the gospel is. It's called notitio. And a lot of Christians don't realize that many Americans have not heard the gospel. Just yesterday in my church, a couple was sharing about their ministry in Laos. And there was an American man in Laos who came over to Laos to study. And he had lived, I don't know, 20, 25 years in America, had never heard the gospel. Mm -hmm. And he heard the gospel for the first time in Laos. So we need to let people know what the gospel of grace is. We are saved by lifting the empty hands of faith before what Christ has done for us. So people need to know what it is, but they might say, okay, I think I understand that concept, not by works, so no one can boast. We receive it by faith. Christ died for me. The only problem is I don't believe in God. (laughs) So we can go back and give a cosmological argument, a design argument, a moral argument, there's just so much to draw from. It's almost an embarrassment of riches uh, yeah. when you look at it. So we yeah, want people to know that. That's true. And I know for me, I'm not really science-minded just by nature, but when I was in faith crisis, it was the cosmological argument that I would wake up every morning and think about and think, I, I cannot get out of this. I can't get around this. This is something that really just gives me 
a lot of it bolsters my faith to think about because it's just there's no way around it in in my view. And so we're going to talk through some of these arguments in a moment. And but let's go to Ike. Ike, uh, Doug mentioned evidence in nature. Let's talk a little bit about natural theology. For anybody who's unfamiliar with that term, what are we talking about when we say natural theology? You know, I feel so blessed to have such great sponsors on this podcast. And many of you may not realize that if you like the content we put out, one of the ways you can support the podcast is to connect with our sponsors, buy their products, and that helps everybody out. It helps them, helps us, and then you get a great product in return. And I only promote products that I personally really believe in. And Carly Jean Los Angeles is no exception. Carly Jean Los Angeles is a Los Angeles-based clothing line founded by Carly Jean Brand. And she's a mom of four. She's a wife. She is a Christian. She's pro-life. Carly Jean comes alongside uh, pregnancy resource centers. I absolutely know that when I buy some clothes from Carly Jean or I buy a cute pair of jeans, I get a cute pair of jeans, but I'm also doing good. And that makes me feel so good about the purchase. Now, m- we've talked about Carly Jean a lot on the podcast so far, but a couple of things you may not be aware of is that they have a men's line as well. And you can link to that on their website, which is carlyjeanlosangeles.com. You can also download their app and get notifications and early sneak peeks on some new stuff coming out and discounts are always running great promotions and great sales. So go to CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com. Use my code ALISA for 20% off your first order. That's CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com. Use my code ALISA for 20% off your first order. Yeah. Well, let's let's start just by talking about the bigger concepts first, and then we'll go into natural sure. theology. Uh, evangelical apologetics must begin with the with the idea that God has spoken, and now, of course, we believe that that God has spoken in many ways, and we call this a revelation, the doctrine of revelation, not the book of revelation, but the doctrine. God has spoken. And that's an amazing gift that God would even uh, think it important to speak to us in such a way that we could understand. Now, but God has spoken not just in the Bible, and of course He's spoken definitively in the Christian scriptures. And we, any other attempts to understand what God may or may not have said needs to be measured against the scripture. But the Bible itself is, is what we call special revelation. Uh, of course, the person and work of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, these are also special revelations of God, uh, specific revelations of God given to specific peoples at specific times. But natural theology comes from the category of general revelation, that God has spoken to all peoples at all times in some ways. Um, of course, general revelation is more limited, but it's also uh, has a broader scope. And so what general revelation does is it forms a point of contact between the Christian who's already received the truth of Jesus Christ as given to us in the scriptures and the person who's outside of the household of faith. So through general revelation, we see that God has revealed himself in nature through the created world, but also in the human conscience, um, that there's a a moral intuition that people have. And even in logic itself and and how logic functions and how we we, uh, reflect upon concepts so God has revealed himself generally to all peoples at all times in those, in those ways. And so what natural theology does then is seeks to use general revelation as source material for reflecting on how God has revealed himself. And typically natural revelation comes in the form of theistic arguments where you take philosophical argumentation and you use it to investigate God's revelation in the natural world and in, in, in the human uh, moral intuition and mind. Um, so that's where these arguments come from, saying that uh, because the universe exists, uh, we can look for a cause of the universe. Because there are moral intuitions, we can look for a grounding for moral uh, for the moral life. Um, that this is where where we take we take these logical categories and we investigate how God has spoken in the world around us. That's good. Anything you want to add to that, Doug? Well, there's a lot to add. Do we have five hours? Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> well, let, let me give you a real simple version of what's called the cosmological argument. And actually, there are different types of cosmological arguments, but one that has been made known really largely through the work of William Lane Craig is the, called the Kalam cosmological argument. And it just has two premises and a conclusion. The first premise, see, premise is 
that anything that begins to exist has a cause of its existence, meaning something doesn't come from nothing. I mentioned that earlier. Second, the universe began to exist, and we have the evidence of Big Bang cosmology for that. We have philosophical arguments for that. So the conclusion is, therefore, follows deductively, actually, that the universe began to exist. So, and the universe had a cause of its existence. Then you have to say, well, what kind of a cause would be adequate or sufficient to create the universe? Would have to be timeless, spaceless, vastly intelligent, and so on. And this gets us on the theistic map. Now, this doesn't tell us if God is a trinity. This argument doesn't tell us if God has come to earth in the person of Jesus. It doesn't tell us if the scripture is inspired. But it's interesting, the Bible sends us to nature, and then nature sends us to God. And so that is a really good first step in the classical method. Let's say you're dealing with an atheist or an agnostic, and they say science has refuted faith. Science undermines Christianity. You say, well, did you know that uh, we have really good scientific evidence, converging arguments for an absolute beginning of the universe? And if that is true, then philosophically, we go back to that first premise that if anything begins to exist, it needs a cause of its existence. Or put it more simply, uh, from nothing, nothing comes. That if anything exists, it has to have a sufficient uh, cause or explanation. So we, we're really specific in the Quran. We're yeah. talking about anything that begins to exist has a cause of its existence because people try to use that against God. They say, oh, so God then needs a cause. No, God has always existed. That's intrinsic to the concept of God. So we can deal with that kind of rebuttal. So there's an argument right there. And it's a, in a way, it's a simple argument. It can get more complex in defending some of the concerns. But it can also be illustrated very nicely. There's a video that Lee Strobel put out some years ago called The Case for a Creator. It's a companion video to his book. And there's about a 10-minute section where they interview William Lane, William Lane Craig and give beautiful graphics to explain why scientists believe the universe began to exist. And they're not even necessarily Christians. But if it began to exist, you've got to do some philosophical work there and say, all right, it either came into being out of nothing for no reason, which is illogical, or it had a cause. Yeah. And that cause has many of the attributes that we find in Scripture. Right. Self-existent, yeah. creator, all powerful and so on. Yeah, I was going to bring up uh, you, you brought it up already. But, you know, some skeptics might say, well, you're just backing up a step because then you got to come up with a cause for God. And I was actually talking with my son about this yesterday. I was teaching him a real simple version of this argument. And we were we were practicing debating it a little bit. And he just kept saying, well, who made that? And then who made that? And who made that? And then I got to and then I tried to stump him. And I said, well, then if you're saying God, then who caused God? And he got a little bit stumped. But then we we, we just talked it through like, well, the whole point of this argument is that something outside of space, time and matter would have to kick the whole thing off. And mm -hmm. so if that thing was caused, then that would be God there. You'd have to you'd have to go to the buck has to stop somewhere with an uncaused cause. Right. And I see Ike, you're smiling because this is your jam right here. Right. The unmoved <laughs> mover. Talk about that a little bit. All right. Well, it's time to talk about Good Ranchers. I love Good Ranchers. I actually really love any kind of product that solves problems. And that's what Good Ranchers does for me. People ask me, how do you do all the things you do? You're always going here, you're going there. And probably the main answer is because my husband and I do it together, but also because I have products that solve problems for me. And with Good Ranchers, I know that I always have a freezer full of high quality beef, grass fed, um, Angus quality beef, no antibiotics or hormones ever, better than organic chicken. I've got beautiful heritage breed pork. And it's all ready to go. And that solves a problem for me because I don't have to make a list and think about it. I can just pull something out of the freezer, thaw it out and cook it up. In fact, we just had some people come stay with us and spend the night. And I thought, well, I'd like to make them a good meal, but I had just come back from speaking at a conference, didn't have time to plan some big meal. So I pulled out some ground beef from my freezer from Good Ranchers, and we made burgers, and they were delicious, and it was easy. It didn't take a lot of time or prep. 
and I got to feed my guests and a great meal, a great high quality meal. So it solves a lot of problems. I love Good Ranchers. So go to goodranchers.com and you can use my code ALISA for $25 off your first box. Give it a try. See what you think. Go to goodranchers.com. Use my code ALISA for $25 off your first box. Yeah, you spot on great explanation for your son there. This is really, yeah, if there is some kind of cause behind whatever brought about this universe, well, then that thing would be God. And the the key behind this is the problem of an infinite regress. Now, that sounds much fancier than it is, <laughs> but the idea is that you can't move back infinitely uh, to to uh, to talk about causation. At some point, you have to speak about a cause that was uncaused, or w- what uh, what Thomas Aquinas called a, a first mover who is unmoved, um, a, or a prime mover. And so that's exactly what we suggest in other kinds of cosmological arguments that there there must be for us to even be at the time that we are now, uh, for us to be experiencing the present. There had to have been. A beginning in the past. Now, this does nothing to impugn the idea that God is infinite. God can have always existed. Uh, it's just that for us as, as finite beings to reflect upon our universe, our cosmos, that we have to be speaking of, of at some point, the regress stops and it's not infinite, that there is a, a moment zero, you might say, uh, the past. And this is exactly what is so well corroborated by Big Bang cosmology. And this is one of the things that I think Christians can get a little concerned about, is that there, there sometimes is a just so story told about Christianity's conflict with science. And there simply is not a conflict on this issue. Now, one of the things we talk about in the book is that there is a real conflict between Darwinism and Christianity, but there's not one between Big Bang cosmology and Christianity. In fact, Big Bang cosmology is 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 a corroborating set of evidence for the truth of the Christian faith that there is a creator. Yeah, in fact, when I talk about this with audiences, I often say, you know, I know you might feel some discomfort with Big Bang cosmology and the evidence we get from there, but read your Bible in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Bang. (laughs) The Bible says that all of uh, the universe exploded into existence out of nothing. And yet, you know, of course, we know there's a cause. One of my, we were talking earlier about how God has spoken, right, through nature and through direct revelation and uh, through general revelation. And if, again, if there are any Christians listening who might be feeling a little bit of discomfort with that, it's important to note that God spoke in all sorts of different ways. You know, he spoke directly to Adam and Eve and Moses and Abraham. Um, He wrote the Ten Commandments on stone with his own finger. I mean, that he didn't even use a human author for the Ten Commandments. That was the finger of God himself. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we know from Romans 1, I just this is one of my favorite passages I'd love to read here because it's so important for us to understand this. For the wrath of God, this is Romans 1, 18 through 23, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to him. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. So Paul is telling us that every person who's ever been born has access to knowledge, not just that God exists, but actually can know things about his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature. And Paul even goes so far to say that these things are clearly perceived by people. And so, yes, I love that you said that we have the rich written word, which is what we measure all things against. But there is so much amazing evidence in creation. And I'd love to talk about more of that. Um, let's talk about the the argument from design, because that kind of goes hand in hand a little bit with the cosmological argument. Uh, who wants to take the argument from design? Well, I think I wrote that chapter, Ike, so I can take the lead. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> yeah. The book is co-authored, but Ike was the principal chap author of several chapters, and I was the principal chapter, author of other chapters. Uh, but we, we agree with ev- everything that's in the book. So the argument design is, is very powerful. And you can start from what's called the fine tuning of the universe as a whole. 
So we consider the factors that are necessary for conscious embodied life, such as the cosmological constant, the force of gravity, all these things. And if it turns out that there are multiple, multiple factors in terms of natural laws and cosmic constants and proportions that have to be just so, have to be tuned on a razor's edge for life to be possible. And these things don't have to be like this. Two plus two has to be four. That's a necessary truth. But these contingencies are just that. They're contingencies. And so there's not one grand logical law that means that everything has to be this way. And the odds of this happening by chance at the Big Bang are just vanishingly small. The numbers are really mind-boggling. And on this one, again, we talk about this in the book, but the video, The Case for a Creator with Lee Strobel, talks about this argument. So what do you have with all this fine-tuning? Well, you only have a couple of possibilities. One is that this vastly, titanically improbable thing just happened. Or that there is one universe and one designing mind behind all these contingencies that are calibrated just perfectly to allow for life. Or you believe that there are an infinity of other universes. This is called the multiverse theory. There are two versions of this, actually. But the multiverse theory is really, I mean, to put it nicely, kind of a Hail Mary attempt by the atheist to rescue the universe without the aid of God's mind. So if we can expand the probability resources to unlimited universes, we're one of the lucky universes that has life. Now, one of the basic principles of explanation is called simplicity or parsimony. So if one entity can explain a series of facts, you don't start multiplying explanatory entities unnecessarily. So. In the book, we say, what's simpler and more compelling, more cogent logically, one creator and one finely tuned universe, or no creator, and then we posit an infinity of unknowable universes. You know, you don't need a, a PhD in philosophy or physics to get that one. It really makes sense that on that level, what's called cosmic fine tuning, one designing mind makes far better sense, is much more logical and more compelling as an explanation, then everything happened by chance, or we have all these multiple universes and we just happen to be the bingo universe, right? So that's the fine tuning on a cosmic scale, but then you can zero in on earth and go from the macroscopic to the microscopic and look at life itself. And we find the patterns of design in life itself, like in the cell, you find uh, what's called irreducible complexity, like molecular machines in the cell that could not have been built up gradually by undesigned causes. Mike Behe's given this argument now for 25 mm -hmm. years. Uh, and you've got with the bacterial flagellum, which is like an outboard motor that sits on the back of a bacterium. Can't be explained in terms of Darwinian mechanisms. You've got to posit an intelligent mind to account for this. And then also the nature of life in terms of information and there, Steve Meyer has done tremendous work on that mm -hmm. in his book, Signature in the Cell, and others. And again, that video, Case for a Creator, makes this case. Life itself in the DNA and RNA involves codes, codes, so language. And this language is so complex and so specified, you cannot account for it on the basis of unguided, mindless causes. Because the materialistic worldview says, basically, in the beginning, for no reason, there was matter and energy. And then 15 billion years later, here we are. Yeah. There's no designing mind. There's no guidance in the universe at all. And of course, the Christian story is in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. All things were made through him. And him here in John 1 is the Logos. So we believe in a mind first, logic first worldview. And then we look at the design of the universe as a whole, the macroscopic, we look at the design of the universe in biology and chemistry. What do we see? We see evidence of a divine mind. So, so no just to play, to... Yeah. Go, go ahead. ahead. Well, I was just going to say to play devil's advocate here, you know, you've made the case that there's this complexity 
Uh, there's all of these, you know, molecular machines on the cellular level, which, by the way, if anybody, you can you can look up on YouTube some videos of what these machines look like in the cell, and it's mm -hmm. absolutely astounding. But, you know, maybe a skeptic would say, okay, I get what you're saying. Maybe that would suggest that this was designed by God. But if God did exist and designed with such complexity, why is there so much evil in the world? You know, couldn't he have worked that out? Couldn't he have uh, figured out a way to make that not so so much suffering and so much evil in the world? I wonder what, right. how would we respond to something like that? Yeah. I think I could be good to respond to that. Yeah, ha happy to. So that response is an honest one and a pretty common one that I've heard when talking about these kinds of evidences. So when somebody offers you uh, an objection like that, it's always good to examine what is assumed in the objection. And so that objection assumes that there is such a thing as evil. Now, I always like to ask somebody, and this is a part of Greg Kokel's work on what he calls tactics, uh, the what do you mean by that question? When you say the word evil, I think I know what you mean by that, but would you mind just giving me a definition of what that is? And typically, when people say that, they, they're talking about something that has objective moral value to it, so that there is something that's actually wrong about what's happening. It's not just that I dislike, let's say, uh, racism or rape or uh, other kinds of awful things. It's that those things are actual sins, egregious sins, that they're, they're actually evil regardless of your opinion of them. And so when I, when I can help somebody to see that assumption in that question, I try to start from that, that idea of, okay, well, do we have any good reason to believe that there are objective moral values, such as uh, rape is always wrong or racism is always evil? And from there, that's where you build a foundation to what we call the moral argument for the existence of God, that uh, if... If uh, there are objective moral values and duties, then there requires uh, to exist an objective moral evaluator, um, somebody who can be uh, the right kind of judge across all peoples and all times. Otherwise, you get into the problem of the cosmic says who. Mm -hmm. So if I say that racism is evil, um, without God, I can simply respond by saying says who. And this is exactly what the uh, Duke Law Professor Arthur Leff says is that we ha we come across this basic uh, this basic issue of there must be an objective moral evaluator for there to be objective moral values and duties, um, and and so in in the book we actually give we have a whole chapter on the moral argument for the existence of God that uh, um, if if uh, God does not exist then moral values and duties do not exist but moral values and duties do exist therefore God exists. And then we go from there to, to talk about exactly the issue that's at the core of that person's concern there, Lisa, which is, well, if God did, did make the world, then why would he allow so much evil? Yeah. And the Christian story really can help to explain this. The Christian story says a number of things. It says first that there are greater goods that only come about in a world where some evil is allowed to exist. Uh, think of the, the, the good of courage. Um, without some kind of uh, difficulty or suffering, courage is meaningless. So we talk about that a little bit in the book and provide some, I think, helpful examples. Um, then there's also uh, what what I, I offer is a free will defense. Now, Doug doesn't offer that, but I, I offer a free will defense that God, um, God would say, uh, to have the right kind of loving relationship that I want to have with free moral agents, I want to offer them the ability to reject my love and to reject... Um, to, to reject uh, uh, living rightly. Um, I think that that means that we as humans are responsible for evil. And that's where I think Doug would agree is we can say humans are the cause of evil, not God. Uh, we are the ones who have alienated ourselves in the universe from God. But then the Christian story, and this is something that I think is probably the most powerful response to this, is that God himself enters into our evil world of suffering is a victim of the worst kinds of suffering through the crucifixion of Jesus on the cross and is victorious over sin and evil and suffering. And at the last day, you get a picture of the new heavens and the new earth where mm. even suffering itself dies, uh, where, where every tear is wiped away from our eyes and there'll be no more mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. So in the Christian story, though suffering is real and awful, it's actually a short part of the story because there's an eternity of bliss 
through the redemption of Jesus Christ. Oh, that's beautiful. And I, I want to just point out, I love that we have two people on the show. You know, we we have disagreements on secondary, third tier issues. And I love that you brought that up. And I want to give Doug a chance um, because I might personally be more inclined to agree with Ike on the free will defense. But Doug, I'd love for you to have your say on that. Like how, how might you approach that uh, not offering a free will defense? Well, that can get a little complicated. I think the free will defense is very useful to defeat one of the formulations of the problem of evil. And that is that it's impossible for God to be all good, all powerful, and there to be any evil. And the free will defense simply says that God allows certain evils through free will to bring about greater goods. And that is a logical possibility. So it actually defeats what's called the logical problem of evil. And this is uh, famously done by Alvin Plantinga several decades ago. Uh, I am more on the reform side of understanding human agency. So if you would read uh, my chapter on the problem of evil in my book, Christian Apologetics, you'd find actually a lot of what's in our book together. Uh, but I, I don't specifically invoke the free will defense in terms of what's called libertarian agency. It gets a little complicated. Sure, actually. sure. Yeah. Uh, what I can I completely agree on is that the Christian narrative gives the most meaning to good and evil and redemption. Yeah. And it's not just a vain hope or a happy idea. Wouldn't it be nice if it were true? It's based on the reliability of the Bible, on the testimony and life and achievements of Jesus Christ. So natural theology brings us to, there is a creator designer God who is the source of moral truth and has given us a conscience. And then we look to history, we look to scripture, and we say, has God revealed himself in space-time actuality? Yes. Do we have a reliable record of that? Yes. What does it say? It says that God so loved the world, he sent his only son, that whoever believes on him might not perish, but have everlasting life. And it makes these great promises to Christians based on God's intersection with history to work out his purposes in history and in eternity. So these two elements of classical apologetics, natural theology, and then the historical evidence work together. And in fact, if someone already believes in the existence of a creator and a designer, but they're not a Christian, then we say, okay, let's talk about what Jesus said and did. And if someone says, well, I'm not sure the Bible's reliable, then we talk about the manuscript evidence, the authority of the authors, the mere, the multiplicity of authors who converge on the truth of Jesus, the four gospels, Paul, and so on. So we just have a lot to draw from in, de in defending and commending the Christian faith as true, rational, and compelling. So we're trying to offer this in this book in a way that is approachable. And as Ike said, we're not assuming, you know, anything about apologetics or philosophy or theology. You know, we want to start at the beginning, but take you as high as we can, take you as deep as we can, but without skipping any steps. Yeah. And you've done a great job with that. And Ike, you introduced a, a minute ago the moral argument. Um, and I think, honestly, next to the cosmological, at least for me personally, the moral argument has been the one that's the most persuasive. You just, I, I always ask audiences, I, I hold up my phone and I say, you know, if, if, morality is subjective or if it's not uh, you know rooted in objective reality um, whose phone am i holding and they'll say well it's your phone and i say well what if there's a, a six foot four linebacker that comes up here and says it's his phone whose phone's it going to be well it's going to be his phone right because he's bigger and stronger and you could probably just take it away from me and so uh, you know i have a hard time getting around the moral argument as far as understanding that Objective morality really is rooted in the nature and character of God. It's something that's higher than just humans having one opinion versus another. Um, but, you know, I suppose playing devil's advocate again, somebody could say something like, well, are you saying that only Christians can be moral? Because I know, you know, my next door neighbor is an atheist and they're wonderful uh, in the community. They give to the poor. They work the soup lines. They take care of their families and they walk their dogs. I mean, are you saying that atheists can't be moral? So, so is that what we're saying with this? 
Right. Yeah. And of course, no, uh, I also have an atheist next door neighbor who is one of the kindest, gentlest people I know. Uh, good hearted, welcomed us to the neighborhood with open arms and offered tangible help and, and love and encouragement. So, of course, we're not saying that uh, that only Christians can be moral. What we're saying is that only the Christian story of reality can account for the fact that we see good people, even among those with whom we disagree. Uh, so I would say for for my atheist friend, what can explain his moral goodness? Um, you know, as Christians, we can say, well, OK, maybe maybe I've I've been redeemed by Jesus enough to where some of the rough edges have worn off and you can see some goodness of God shining through me. Praise God for that. But what about my atheist friend who seems to be living a good and moral life? Um, well, this is actually at the heart of a lot of what you try to discuss on this podcast, Elisa, with just progressive Christians. They'll say, they'll say things like, "Well, my Muslim neighbors are are lovely people, right. and my friends." And why would you say that Christianity is right and all these other religions are wrong? What we're saying is that only the Christian perspective on reality can account for the existence of the categories of moral good and evil. You have to have what you just said. Uh, a God who is the foundation, the grounding of moral values and duties. Uh, God himself is good. And when we say that something is good, we're simply recognizing one of God's attributes that has uh, that is uh, bled out into the world that he's created. So the fact that we can even understand that there is such a thing as objective good and evil requires that God exists and is the objective objective moral evaluator of our actions. Doug, do you want to add to that? Well, I think that's very well put, because sometimes we'll give an argument for the existence of God, like the moral argument, and people will misconstrue what we're saying. And we just need to be very clear as to what the argument is. We're not saying that in order to know moral truth or to engage in good actions, you have to believe in the Christian God. We're not saying that. We're giving a metaphysical account for the reality of objective good. And we're saying that naturalism cannot explain objective good or a knowledge of it, nor for that matter can pantheism, because the god of pantheism is a impersonal, abstract, something that can't even be discussed or understood. Hmm. But, you know, the, another argument that we don't go into really in the book, I do in my big apologetics book, is uh, has Christianity been on balance a force for good or evil in the world? Hmm. That's another, but that's another argument. That's not the moral argument for God. That's more an argument related to the practical effects of Christians in the world. And Christianity has been blamed for everything, <laughs> racism, yeah. sexism, everything else. I do have a chapter in my larger book, Christian Apologetics, on uh, distortions of Christianity and so on. But that's that's a separate argument. So when you're trying to make some progress intellectually with anybody, you have to stay in the lane, basically. And a lot of people today don't know how to stay in the lane intellectually because they're mm -hmm. very intellectually undisciplined. So what we want to do gently and kindly, but forcefully is say, well, okay, this is what we're talking about right now. So let's deal with that. So if you give an argument from design and people say, yeah, but what about evil? Say, well, what about the evidence that there's a designer? Let's deal with that. It doesn't go away because there's evil in the world. The evidence is still there. It's positive. It's on the table. Let's deal with that. Then we'll deal with these other issues. You know, so step by step, one at a time. Yeah, Takes that's, a certain amount that's of good. Just, yeah, because yeah, people will pull. They're, they're very good at pulling you off your point and trying to get you onto something else. Ike, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Yeah, this is something that we address in the book is the virtues of an apologist. Um, of course, it can be frustrating when you're having a conversation with somebody with whom you disagree where they might want to change subjects or change directions. Um, a, a good apologist is patient. <laughs> it can yeah. say, well, can we pause for just a moment and go back to the original issue? I, I would be happy to talk about evil in the world and suffering in the world. Let's for sure get to that. And that's a good thing, too, because that can ensure that the conversation keeps going. Right. Mm -hmm. But you can say, let's, let's go back and focus on this for a second. And as Christians, we shouldn't get discouraged if we feel personally attacked when we're having apologetic encounters. Um, we should expect that people who are alienated from Jesus through their sin will push back against our attempts to tell them about the truth. 
And we don't have to take that personally. Uh, they're, they're rejecting Jesus. They're not rejecting us. And even if they are rejecting us, it's for the sake of Jesus. And we should be honored for that. Uh, we should feel honored for that. And so we can simply say, well, let's let's pause for a moment and go back to that. I always encourage people to, to exercise the virtue of patience, of humility. Assume that you don't know everything <laughs> or that maybe maybe they have a question that you haven't considered before. Ask good questions and be a good listener. These are all virtues that apologists should have. And remember, it's not your job to close the deal, so to speak. <laughs> you don't have to be the one who gets them to pray the sinner's prayer. That can be somebody else's job. You can do, again, what Greg Hochul would say is just put a stone in their shoe. Mm -hmm. Offer them something that will, that will uh, upset them intellectually but then offer them the comfort that only comes through the gospel. And this is something that just a benefit of being Doug's student that I had is that he always encouraged me, no matter what you're talking about, make sure you present the gospel. Always go back to that. You never want to just stay in the abstract about, can we trust the Bible? And of course we can, and we should explain that. But what does the Bible say? The Bible is the story of the gospel of the kingdom of God. And we should always come back to that and say, hey, no matter what I'm talking about here, if there's one thing I want you to know, it's that God himself has in his sovereign power seen the world of suffering and entered into it through the person of Jesus Christ, died on your behalf and mine and has risen victoriously. And I think there are good reasons to believe all of these things. That's very good. You know, I always tell people, too, because I think some Christians might even be scared to start having these conversations, especially if you're just dipping your toe into these apologetics waters. I remember when I first started learning this stuff, I felt so stupid. I saw people debating presuppositionalism versus classical, and I saw people talking about words like epistemology and ontology, and I just I felt so dumb. And I started studying the cosmological argument, and it took me, honestly, a year before I could even see say it back out because I just I had to just get it in my bones and and read about it and listen about it enough that it became conversational. So I think some Christians are kind of scared to have these conversations, but I would hope to encourage anybody that's listening or watching, you don't have to be scared because it doesn't listen, I promise you all three of us, Doug, Ike and myself, somebody could ask us a question that we do not know the answer to at any time. It it would not be that hard to stump me. I can tell you that. You ask me something about bacterial flagellum and I'm going to be lost. But the good news is that there are amazing intellectuals who have done the hard work and the heavy lifting on these topics. So if you don't know the answer, you don't have to. You just have to be curious enough to be willing to go on a journey with somebody and say, hey, you know what? I, I know I heard something about that. I don't really know the answer. But let me do some research this week and let's get together in a week or so and have coffee again and we can talk more about it. Or maybe I can point you to a resource that can help you. Uh, and, and honestly, that type of uh, mentality is really what made me feel free to do Q&As when I go speak, because I certainly don't know everything, but I'm not afraid to say I don't know. And I think that's a really key point for Christians is you don't have to be afraid of that. So in a moment, we're going to, I'm going to give you guys just kind of a final word to encourage people, but I want to just do one more little piece of pushback that a, a Christian might have heard this whole conversation, and they might be thinking, my goodness, you've talked about the cosmological argument, the argument from design, and the moral argument, but like, what does this have to do with Jesus? I mean, you could be proving the Muslim God for, for all I know. So, so what would we say to comfort the heart of a Christian that might be saying, why do I need to know all this stuff? And it's not even about Jesus. Well, it is about Jesus, because <laughs> in the beginning uh, was the word right? The Logos. The beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. All things were created by Him. So we're talking about the pre-incarnate second person of the Trinity was the agent of creation. Of course, the whole Trinity was involved with creation. We know that from Scripture. So we're talking about the reign of the Logos, and He has made Himself known in the creation that He brought about. So that's step one. You really can't understand the God incarnate until you understand the God pre-incarnate. So we've got natural theology to give us the Logos in a sense, or to show the Logos is a better explanation for the world than a non-Logos world, which is naturalism and pantheism, right? And then we say, the word has become flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And here's all the reasons to believe 
The Logos is not simply the intelligent ordering principle of the universe who created it, but the God who cares for us, who came to us to suffer and die, to atone for our sin, to rise from the dead, to ascend to heaven, and he will come back to make all things right. That's good. Ike, you want to add to that? Yeah, I would say the whole second half of our book is dealing specifically with with the claims of the credentials identity of Jesus Christ, what he's done, and how when we believe that uh, that Jesus has died and risen from the dead and ascended into heaven, these aren't what some would call just faith claims. You know, when I was a student in in undergrad, one of my religious studies teachers said, of course, the Bible is a faith document. And I, as a well-meaning young man, uh, affirmed that, yeah, of course, it's a faith document. But what he was saying is that it can't be shown to be true through history. And this is exactly what we try to uh, dissuade people of in this book, that no, there are historical facts that are best explained by the Orthodox Christian understanding of the identity and mission and work of Jesus Christ. And so we get into those details um, uh, in, in the late, later chapters of the book to, to point specifically to, to Jesus uh, and, and the truth of who he is. And that's really the, the classical approach says, let's start by showing that God exists. And then let's talk about how God has revealed himself in yeah. the scripture and in the person of Jesus Christ. It is a kind of two-step approach. But what's really helpful about this, and you brought this up a moment ago, is that this could just be Muslim apologetics, right? Well, starting with natural theology can actually be helpful to establish common ground with theists, with Muslims and, and Jews who believe that God exists, because we can affirm what they know intuitively to be true as Christians. And we can say, isn't it fascinating, for example, that the Kalam cosmological argument comes to us first through Arabic speaking philosophers, and then it comes into the Western world. Uh, and that's that's a, an important point of contact that we yeah. can have with Muslim friends. But once we've established that and we can earn a little bit of trust and credibility, then we can say, well, let's talk about, for my Muslim friends, I would say, let's talk about Isa al-Masih. That's Jesus in Arabic. Let's talk about Isa al-Masih. I'm a follower of Isa. Can I explain to you why I think that he really is who the Bible says he is and the Bible wasn't corrupted? And I mm -hmm. think if you if you do this artfully and carefully, you can earn a hearing for the specific claims of Christianity by starting with common ground of showing that a God exists. Yeah, that's really well put, both of you, because in classical apologetics, it's really a cumulative case that we're going for. We start with these arguments for the existence of God. Certainly, the the cosmological argument isn't going to get you to the resurrection of Jesus, but it's the first step on the way. It's it's laying down those breadcrumbs for people to follow, building that case for the truthfulness of Christianity, which is the explanation of all reality. Well, this has been such a wonderful conversation. I'm so grateful to both of you. I'd like to give you both about a minute to just give our listeners a final word of encouragement, but also let them know where they can connect with you online. Doug, I know that you have a wonderful podcast, The Truth Tribe. Talk about that. Final words. Go ahead, Doug, you can start. Right. Well, if you want to know more um, about my ministry, you can go to my webpage, douglasgrotheis.com. I have a weekly podcast where we talk about apologetics, ethics, cultural criticism, and so on. And my final words, I guess, would be what I say every week in my service is Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And I would add an apologetic footnote. And we can know this through sound and valid rational arguments. Amen. Ike. <laughs> you can find out more about uh, my publishing and some of my research at IkeShepherdson.com. I'm Andrew Ike Shepherdson, but my website is IkeShepherdson.com. Um, you can also search for the Lee Strobel Center for Evangelism and Applied Apologetics at Colorado Christian University, where I teach. And my final word would be that God wants to use you with your story, with where you are with apologetics today, with what you know, with what you don't know, that God wants to use you. If there's a pastor listening to this podcast, I would encourage you, teach apologetics to your congregation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and invite Doug to speak to your church. Invite me to speak to your church. You can enable and empower your people with apologetic moments in sermons to, uh, to help them to see, yes, I can actually do this. God can use me to speak the truth in love to people around me. 
Very good. Well, I want to thank my guests. Be sure and pick up their book, The Knowledge of God and the World and the Word. It's a great introduction to classical apologetics. I also want to mention one of today's sponsors, which is Southern Evangelical Seminary. I'm a student there. I love SES. Go to ses.edu slash Elisa. You can download a free ebook there and find out more about what SES has to offer. And as always, as we pursue Christ, let's remember to keep a sharp mind, a soft heart, and a thick skin. We'll see you next time.